Hello all and welcome to the Lucretia Report. I'm Ian and today we live in a dystopian nightmare. I was scrolling through YouTube the other day and I came across an organization called Represent Us. Great organization, I'll plug them later. And in this video I was watching, they talked about the findings of Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page from Princeton University. And this is what they found. I had no idea how bad things actually were until I saw this one graph. Researchers at Princeton University looked at more than 20 years worth of data to answer a pretty simple question. Does the government represent the people? Now, this is what they found. This axis here represents public support for any given idea. On the left, at 0%, are ideas that not a single American wants. On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, Take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just gonna quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if you've ever felt like your opinion doesn't matter and that the government doesn't really care what you think, well, you're right. But there's a catch. This flat line only accounts for the bottom 90% of income earners in America. Economic elites, business interests, people who can afford lobbyists, they get their own line. Look at how much closer their line is to the ideal. When they want something, the government is much more likely to do it. And when they don't, they have the power to completely block it from happening, no matter how much the rest of the country supports it. They get what they want, and guess who ends up paying for it. That's crazy, right? I'm not the only one that thinks that's crazy, am I? So let's look at how we got here, and why the beacon of democracy in the world has devolved into a corrupt plutocracy. First, let's talk about perhaps the most well-known and most derided part of all of this, campaign finance, especially after the Citizens United decision. To very much simplify things, here's what happened. A group called Citizens United wanted to run attack ads against Hillary Clinton before a 2008 Democratic primary, but FEC regulations didn't allow independent groups to buy ads, referred to as electioneering communications, within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election. So Citizens United sued the FEC, and the Supreme Court ruled not only to abolish these regulations, but that there was now no limit on how much money independent organizations, read special interests and corporations, could spend on election communications. Here to discuss the legal reasoning behind the case is the veteran 20-year attorney host of the Liberal Lawyer podcast. The legal reasoning that came out of the Citizens United decision are specious, to say the least. They are thoroughly corrupt. Uh, it has You can see the results over the last almost 10 years now. But let's, let's talk about just a couple of things that make it so ridiculously corrupt and, and so antithetical to... Um, to correct legal reasoning and correct jurisprudence. The first thing that's a problem, and actually this isn't so much legal reasoning, but something I've noticed in my more than 20 years as a lawyer. When you look at a decision and it's like really, really long, you know that it's, it's a bad decision or you can be reasonably certain. The reason is because if something were so clear cut or so obvious or, or so tidy, you wouldn't need a 
a ton of pages to explain your reasoning. Basically, the only reason you need a lot of pages to explain reasoning is when you know that what you're doing is wrong. When a Supreme Court decision, or really any federal court decision, is just super long, generally speaking, you're going to have, um, you're, you're going to know that it's uh, an unsound decision. The second thing, it attempts to look at First Amendment political speech in a total hermetically sealed vacuum. That's a problem because it ignores 240 years of context, it ignores reality, uh, it ignores state and federal law that have said forever that political speech is totally different from First Amendment speech such as you're walking down the street and you're talking to somebody. We have always held campaigns to be different because they, they influence so many people. This has profound consequences for our elections, profound consequences for our future. And so for that reasoning, uh, for that reason, states and the federal government have always imposed limitations on how much money you can, you can spend because voting is the one thing in society that sort of equalizes everybody. And in order to equalize everybody, you have to make you have to put everybody on an equal footing. Well, the Supreme Court decided to ignore all of that. Also decided to ignore the idea that somebody's influence over another person is itself a corrupting influence. The Supreme Court decided to just throw that out and say, well, we don't care how much influence one a person A has over person B. It is not inherently corrupt. That is hogwash. It is simply not, it does not hold up to reality. It is a thoroughly corrupt way of looking at something. And the only way you arrive at that is to ignore not just the 240 years of history of this country, but pretty much all of human history. And then the third thing that really jumps off the page at you is that we have always placed restrictions on the First Amendment. For example, I cannot walk into court and claim that I have a First Amendment right to lie to the judge. If, a, if an attorney walks into court and tells the judge, Your Honor, I have a First Amendment absolute freedom of speech right under the, under the Citizens United decision to lie to you, to lie to the jury if there's a jury present, what do you think the judge would say about that? Do you think the judge would say, yeah, Mr. Liberal Lawyer, you're right. You have a total First Amendment right under the First Amendment to, to say anything you like and there's nothing I can do about it. Or do you think the judge would more likely say, I'm holding you in contempt, you're being sanctioned, I'm recommending you for prose for prosecution, recommending you to the Bar Association for prosecution. Good luck not getting disbarred. I think action B is probably what the court would do. The judge, I mean. A thank you to the liberal lawyer for his contribution. Check the description for a link to his podcast. And check out the full 15 minutes in another video coming out alongside this one. You ever see those ads where they'll have a picture of some politician with the saturation and the brightness real low? And there'll be some ominous voiceover saying that this person wants to eat your children. This message brought to you by Americans United for prosperity and peace and, and good things and, and for a better tomorrow. Yeah, that's what those independent organizations are. They're usually just a conglomeration of corporate actors who put together a pack with a nice sounding name. So these lobbyists will butter up politicians with nearly unlimited contributions and then threaten to throw their weight behind their opponents if they don't cooperate. According to the Sunlight Foundation, the most politically active companies has spent $5.8 billion in the last few years corrupting politicians and have reaped $4.4 trillion in rewards from it. Here's what a trillion dollars looks like. Pallets of $100 bills stacked too high covering four football fields. Now multiply that by four. Sometimes they even straight up write the laws. It's called model legislation, and USA Today found that in the past eight years, 10,000, over 10,000 model bills have gone through state legislatures. Surprise, surprise, that doesn't mean bills that are the model of what a bill should be. No, it's bills that are straight up written by interest groups with insert state here brackets, and then passed out to politicians that they have in their pockets to ram through state houses. People like Jerry Sonnenberg of Colorado. Jerry here introduced the Asbestos Transparency Act into the Colorado General Assembly. 
Asbestos transparency. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Actually, it's a piece of model legislation fed to Sonnenberg by ALEC, a model legislation factory. Its real goal is to make it harder for people who have gotten things like cancer to sue the people who are poisoning them. And guess who's pushing it? Yeah, the poisoners are. This exact same bill has been introduced in 32 states, and it's gone into law in 12 of them. You can read it for yourself on Alex's website, link below. But when corporations and interest groups aren't pushing model legislation out to their minions, they're becoming the regulators themselves. Let's look at the current United States cabinet. The Secretary of the Treasury was a hedge fund manager at Goldman Sachs. The Secretary of Defense was a Boeing executive. The Secretary of the Interior was a mining lobbyist. The Secretary of Commerce owned an equity firm. The Secretary of Health and Human Services was a pharma executive. The Secretary of Education ran for-profit charter schools. And the EPA administrator was a coal lobbyist. And that's just a few of them. The problem runs way deeper than just cabinet level appointments. All through the executive branch, on the federal and state levels, the people who regulate corporations are representatives of those very same corporations. And at every turn they seek to enrich themselves and their friends at the expense of the health and well-being of the American people. So they come to our politicians. They essentially bribe them. They extort them with the threat of losing their seats. They feed them phony bills. And then they get their friends appointed to regulate them. But what happens if their pet politicians ever do leave office? Well, they just go right on to become lobbyists themselves. It's called the revolving door. It's where people will go from being lobbyists to politicians, back to being lobbyists. Gee, that doesn't sound like a conflict of interests. And it happens all the time. One in five American children are born into poverty. People die in droves every single day of preventable diseases. Wages are stagnant and housing is unaffordable. Jobs are being lost to machines. Our life expectancy is going down because of suicides and drug overdoses. And the rich just keep getting richer, while the poor just keep getting poorer. Meanwhile, our politicians are bribed and extorted by those very same wealthy elites. Following their commands, letting them regulate themselves, and passing their handwritten laws. You have healthcare companies blocking healthcare. You have private prisons putting people in prison. You have banks writing banking laws and you have big coal pushing coal. This isn't democracy. This is oligarchy. This is corruption. And if we don't act, democracy is going to die. If we don't act, to stop selfish elitist billionaires from having a stranglehold on our democracy. It'll be the end of democracy in America. We have to act. You have to act. Go to 270towin.com slash elected officials. Call your members of Congress and express your support for the For the People Act, which helps to limit rampant corruption. Then go to represent.us and hit the donate button. Represent Us is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working to help break the wheel and fix our corrupt system. Our democracy is dying. And we need to go save it. We need to go save it now. If you enjoyed this, like and subscribe. And follow me on Twitter. And then check out the liberal lawyer on Apple Podcasts. A big thanks to him for contributing. I'll see you next time on the Lucretia Report. Seek Semper Tyrannus.